the Gospel today presents us with a beautiful story of a wonderful miracle that our Lord worked in curing ten people from an incredibly debilitating and degrading disease. And they were all happy that they were cured. We can imagine this must have been one of the happiest days of their lives. But only one of them came back to thank our Lord. And this story is very commonly cited as an example of a very common problem with human nature, a problem that we all suffer from. And that is our lack of appreciation of what God does for us. We look at these ten people in this story, and and we are, are shocked and even outraged at the way they behaved. And we can't understand how nine out of ten of them could have had such a wonderful thing happen to them and not even come back and thank our Lord. But if we examine our own conscience, we will probably not like what we see in terms of how much gratitude we have towards God. And since leprosy in scripture is very commonly used as an image of the soul in the state of sin, the story of these ten lepers being cured is very often mentioned by the spiritual writers to demonstrate the lack of gratitude that we sinners also have when our Lord cures us of the the leprosy of sin in our souls. How many times has our Lord forgiven us of some very serious sin in confession? And we kneel down briefly afterwards, we say the penance that we are obliged to say, and that was it. We didn't say any extra prayers of thanksgiving. And we didn't even feel any emotion or thought of gratitude towards God. Being forgiven of our sins is something that we often take for granted. So I wanted to talk about that today, particularly about having gratitude about the sins that God has forgiven us. In order to understand how grateful we should be towards God for forgiving our sins, though, we first have to understand the seriousness of being in the state of sin and also how wonderful it is what God does to us when he forgives us. And it really is the work of God's grace drawing us back to him when we repent and confess our sins. Our Lord said, no man can come to me unless the Father draw him. And St. Thomas Aquinas explained this passage by talking about a rock that naturally falls to the ground by gravity unless something lifts it up, some outside force raises it. And when it falls to the ground, it can't raise itself back up into the air. And our fallen human nature is like the rock in this, in this analogy. Our sins are constantly dragging us down, and, and we have no power within ourselves to raise ourselves up to, to the thought of, of supernatural things or to to the desire of of heaven, unless God's grace draws us up. And that is why we have to be constantly praying for God's grace to do that for us. Of course, we cooperate with God's grace when he gives it to us, uh, and a rock does not really cooperate when someone lifts it up. So the analogy is not completely exact, but it gives us an idea of how weak we are and how much help we need from God in order to rise up against our fallen nature. But let us think about what amazingly good things happen to us when we are forgiven of our sins and when we are brought back to sanctifying grace. When we are forgiven, that removes sin from our soul, sin which is the greatest evil, and it reconciles us to God. We become God's friends again. The worst evil that sin brings upon us is that it makes us the object of God's hatred. Since God is infinitely good, he must have an infinite hatred for anything evil. It says in the Psalms, Thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. 
the bloody and deceitful man the Lord will abhor. Now, of course, God desires the good of the sinner. He wants the sinner to repent. And in that sense, he, he loves him because he wants what is good for him. But if a sinner perseveres in sin to the end of his life, God does not have any more love for that person at that point. And he plunges him into hell, which is what he deserves. The enmity of God is the worst possible evil for us, as I said. It, it cuts us off from God's friendship, which is the source of every blessing. And when God forgives us our sins, he saves us from that great evil by bringing us back to his love. If we think about how terrifying the thought of being God's enemy is, that also shows us how wonderful and glorious it is to be his friend. Because it is a basic principle that if something is really, really good, its opposite is really, really bad, and vice versa. So the joy and happiness of being God's friend is as proportionally great as is the terror and, and the horror of being his enemy. And since the worst thing that can possibly happen to us is to be God's enemy, then being his friend is the greatest possible good. And that is what God confers upon us when he forgives us our sins. And this is even more wonderful to think about when we realize that, as I said, we ourselves can do nothing to earn this great good. Just as we didn't do anything to, to deserve to be created in the first place, in the same way, after we fall into sin, we can't do anything to deserve uh, our redemption or our justification. It is given to us purely by the love and the generosity of God. Another great blessing that we receive when we are forgiven of our sins is that we are saved from eternal punishment. We are not liable to being sent to hell anymore. Of course, if we turn away from, from God's love and we reject him by serious sin, and we turn to creatures, it is only just that God completely turns away from us and then uses creatures to inflict punishment on us. And this is why hell exists. And the sufferings of hell are, are so great we can't even imagine them. <clears throat> if we think of the worst possible pain someone could endure in this life, whether from some disease or some injury or, or even from being tortured by other people, it bears no comparison to the sufferings of hell. And it isn't just physical sufferings that we're talking about in hell, but it's also the guilt of conscience, the worm that dieth not, and the regret of having destroyed one's entire being for the worthless pleasures of this world. On top of all of that is, is the horrible and terrifying presence of the demons and, and completely evil people, the other, the other lost souls in hell. Imagine being locked up in a dungeon with all of the, the worst and most desperate criminals in the world. How terrifying that would be, and yet that is only a faint image of being locked up forever with, with the other sinners in hell. And because of all of these things in hell, there is no rest or joy, there is no peace and no hope. There is nothing but, but perpetual, eternal anger and hatred and blasphemy and gnashing of teeth. But all of this is what a person is saved from when he repents and is forgiven of his serious sins. That is why we should be on our knees thanking God every time we come out of the confessional. And even if we have not confessed mortal sins in that confession we still have been brought further away from, from that awful fate by having venial sins forgiven and by having uh, sanctifying grace strengthened in our souls. 
Another wonderful thing that happens to us when God forgives us is that we are regenerated inside. Our souls are healed in a very real manner. Sin corrupts the faculties of our souls, and, and God's grace restores them. A person in sin is miserable and weak in the spiritual life. He can hardly do any good works, and he can hardly stay out of further sins. It's like that person is on a slippery slope going downwards. He becomes the slave of, of bad habits of sin. When another temptation comes along, that person is even weaker to resist that temptation than he was the one before. And he gets harder and harder to come back as his will becomes more and more weakened. But when a person repents and is forgiven, a lot of that is taken away. That, that, that process, that downhill slope that the person was on is reversed. God in his goodness doesn't only take away the person's sin and restore him to sanctifying grace. And then, but God does not at that point leave the person still subject to all the problems that he developed in his, in his downward progression. No, God pours strength into that person's soul and he repairs a lot of the destruction the person inflicted on his will. God fills that soul with actual graces and he reaches down, he brings that person back up and puts him back on the road of virtue. He strengthens that person's power of virtue to ensure that he continues in the good that he has begun by his good confession. He gives him a strong uh, and healthy hatred of sin and love of virtue. Now all of these changes that I have described that happen in a person's soul when he is forgiven are so powerful and dramatic that the spiritual writers compare them to a person being raised from the dead. There is no greater possible miracle than, than a dead person to be raised to life. And yet, in, a, in the spiritual order, it's a far greater miracle for a dead soul to be brought back to the life of grace and to have all of these effects happen in it that I just described. The saints have said that no human being could ever describe the immense beauty of a soul in sanctifying grace. They say that if we had a vision of the beauty of a soul in sanctifying grace, we would think that we were looking at God himself. In a, in a sense, we kind of are, because sanctifying grace is a participation in the life of God. It's like the, the, the beauty and the power and the life of God are being reflected in that soul, like, like, uh, like a reflection in a mirror, like the soul is that mirror. And God fills that soul with the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost and with his love. But even then, God is still not finished in his transformation of the soul that is justified. After all of these preparations that I've been describing, that all happen in a single instant, the Holy Ghost himself comes and dwells in that person's soul. The person becomes a temple of the Holy Ghost. In fact, the entire Blessed Trinity dwells in the soul in sanctifying grace. Our Lord said in the Gospel, if anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and will make our abode with him. So let us take all of these thoughts very seriously, and take our soul seriously. It is not just a slight error or a mistake when we commit a mortal sin. And when we repent and we are forgiven, we have had our soul raised from the dead back to life. And the change that God has done to us is beyond our comprehension. And we should thank our Lord when he does this to us. And especially ask for his help to maintain that, that, that goodness and that treasure in our souls. And not fall again into serious sin. And if we are struggling with serious sin, if that is something difficult for us, 
we have to do whatever it takes to win that struggle. We have to pray fervently every day, increase our, our prayer life, pray more fervently and more prayers every day. We have to practice mortification, even in things that are innocent in themselves, and avoid anything that could lead us back to our, our former sins. That is the true gratitude that our Lord wants to see from us. Let us be that, that one man, not even a Jew, that one Samaritan who came back. Let us not be the other nine. Because the more we appreciate that gift of sanctifying grace, the more we will hang on to it and ask God's help to do so. And the more certain we will make our salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.